and he is Christian. Oh, hi. All right. I've just been talking to a blank, blank screen, I guess. Hi. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's Good practice run. Uh, let's get started then. Um, all right, I should be sharing my screen now. You should be able to see that, and we're all good. Can you hear me? Are we good? All right, we must be good. Unless this is something. All right, let's try this again. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, API management and service mesh, something that I've been familiar with and involved with in the ecosystem for a solid three years now, maybe a little bit longer. And before that, I've, I've been involved in helping organizations build microservice style architectures on top of Kubernetes and cloud platforms. And uh, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today comes from some of the writing that I've been doing over the last few years. Uh, so a few years ago, I wrote something you know, called API gateways are going through an identity crisis. And more recently I wrote about this topic specifically. And I encourage you to go through and read that for a little bit more in-depth treatment. But the, the premise here is that as we go to cloud-based platforms like a Kubernetes, like a public cloud, like some of these ephemeral and elastic based infrastructures that um, we, we develop our applications in a way to take advantage of that. So we might go to something like a microservices style architecture, but the complexity of those systems by breaking things down into smaller pieces and encouraging them to speak over the network, you know, that, that pushes a lot of that complexity to the network. And in the past, we would like to solve these types of problems which aren't entirely new, right? Because we've known that the network isn't reliable and you know the distributed, the, the fallacies of distributed computing and so forth. But in, in the past, we would like to solve these by putting, a, putting a, a thing in the middle that would solve the problem magically, right? So we would, we've seen things like ESBs, seen things like uh, enterprise application integration and, and so forth. And as we started to modernize and move more toward HTTP-based services, REST-based services, we did the exact same thing with the API management um, for, um, capabilities and, and products. So, the, but API management did solve some difficult problems for us and was, is very useful, right? How do we build these services and reuse them? How do we expose them to, uh, partners and organizations outside of ours? How do we solve some of the technology challenges around managing these, these services? Things like security, things like observability and quota and policy enforcement and, and so forth. How do we build a business out of these APIs and wrap with monetization and so forth? So sticking the thing in the middle, forcing all the traffic through it, trying to get whatever we can out of that has been a common pattern. But as I mentioned, the more we go to cloud-based infrastructures where things are elastic and scalable and ephemeral, most importantly, where your services might be there, might not be there, might be in a different zone if they're auto scaling and so forth. Um, that those legacy API management tools don't fit that paradigm very well. They don't, scale very well. They're typically tied to large unwieldy databases. From a process perspective, what we build around it, it it's, it's, it's a bottleneck in our organization. Um, it's built on legacy te technology, which in itself isn't that it isn't the bad thing, right? We still have banks running COBOL and mainframes, right? And they're doing it very successfully. It's not the legacy technology, but it's the way that they were built they were not built to uh, live in this highly dynamic environment. So for example, we've uh, at Solo where I work, we've, we've worked with clients who are modernizing their API management technology and they realize things that are heavily based in, for example, Java or heavily based in things like Lua. Um, you know, they don't, they don't fit that dynamic world very well. 
so let's 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 say we go from this static world to this dynamic world, and we, as we like to do in technology, we let we go from one end of the spectrum and swing wildly to the other end of the spectrum. All right. So uh, we, we, we've seen people say, all right, but that way of doing things, let's, let's look at this new buzzword service mesh that's coming in, into the picture and see how we can use that to solve some of these challenges. And there is, there is some fit there. There is some really good fit there because instead of forcing everything to a highly centralized system, uh, based on legacy technology, it wasn't built for cloud and force all of our processes on top of that highly, highly centralized. Let's decentralize that operation. Let's decentralize the way that that is implemented. And the service mesh does that. Service mesh allows you to take those capabilities of um, the API gateway and put it closer to the application. In fact, put, a, put the actual gateway, the proxy next to the application. And that proxy ends up offloading some of the responsibility that the application would otherwise have to deal with when talks over the network. Things like resilience, things like timeouts, retries, circuit breaking, load balancing, service discovery. And you know, put that in a little out of process proxy that lives with the application. And if all of the applications in the system have that, now they've consistently are able to solve some of those challenges and the complexities that get pushed into the network that, that we were talking about earlier. And things like um, TLS and mutual TLS, things like identity of these services and writing policy about these services can be achieved with, uh, with, with a model like this. So service mesh technology typically provides this, this type of capability, a highly decentralized approach to doing things like load balancing, to securing the service to service communication, um, telemetry collection and observability, and um, writing policies and, and quota-based usage and so forth. And so that's all good, right? But again, going from highly, highly centralized model, which doesn't work, to the highly decentralized model, what what are you giving up, and what isn't there today for a typical service mesh implementation, and and things that you need, right? So that starts to look like this. There are things at the edge of your your service mesh and your service estate that you still need to solve for you still need to solve for the unknown users that might be coming in and using your, your APIs, All right? So you might need more sophisticated security at the edge. You might need custom security at, at the edge. You might need usage and policy-based um, throttling and rate limiting. You might need developer portal and self-service access, lifecycle management of the services that you're um, proposing that, that folks outside your organization or uh, outside of your part of the organization might want. You might need message transformation as you go through these boundaries. You, you, know, you, you want to maintain an abstraction so that you don't leak the details of a particular implementation. And so these are capabilities that aren't available in a service mesh today and might not necessarily make sense all the way down to the level of the sidecar in uh, in a service mesh environment. So the the question is now how do you, how do you get the best of both worlds? How do you how do you go from a highly centralized model to a decentralized model, but maintain the capabilities that that you need? And in our experience, or my experience, Envoy proxy ends up actually becoming a very common and powerful component between to, to service both of these different types of roles or, and even more roles. And what I mean by that is network roles inside of your application network. What are the different roles and responsibilities to that, 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 uh, that you need to achieve these different pieces of functionality and do it in a way that makes sense for 
a cloud deployment. So Envoy Proxy is that, it's a proxy. It's an open source from, uh, you know, it's in the CNCF, a graduated top level project. Envoy was built specifically to live in this highly dynamic world. Um, it was built to be extended so that it can fit multiple different use cases. And we see now the evidence of that, wherein gateways and service mesh technology alike are adopting Envoy as their core proxy and doing that quite successfully. So Envoy was, again, built to live in this cloud environment, highly dynamic, configurable on the fly, no hot reloads and that kind of thing, and can be used at the edge to allow traffic in. So it, it plays the role of an edge, edge gateway to allow traffic into a fleet of services. It can also be used as a middle gateway, an internal gateway. So as traffic comes into your system, it can be pushed out to different, let's say, logical groupings uh, within your architecture. And especially those at large organizations might realize that different lines of business might you know, have their own set of services. They might want to expose those and share them with other lines of business. But Envoy can be used as, as a mediator uh, to facilitate that, solving things like traffic routing, solving things like load balancing, um, telemetry collection, security enforcement at the edge now and now deeper into your, your architecture, as well as all the way down to the level of uh, the, the service proxy, which is a, a sidecar um, process that lives with the application and solves some of these, these concerns on behalf of the application. So Envoy plays the core, or can play the core piece of technology that solves problems in multiple roles. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the first part to, to take in. Now, coming back to the title of the talk, and um, you know, what, what, going from the highly centralized model with some of the older technology it wasn't built for, cloud deployments into, well, what is that newer technology doing? All right, it's doing it in a more decentralized way, but it, you're, you're still not getting the full capabilities of, of managing APIs that you will need. And if you look at Envoy, Envoy's ability to play different roles, we can see uh, you know, where those overlap expectedly, right? If, if you're using the same technology to play both of these roles, there's gonna be some overlap. And the things that you get in an API gateway, things like uh, you know, traffic ingress, traffic coming in, controlling it, routing it, maybe doing traffic shadowing and that kind of thing. You also get things like distributed tracing and telemetry collection integration with Prometheus and Datadog and so forth. Um, originating, terminating TLS and, and mutual TLS between the services. So we do get some of those same benefits, but now, where things differ and where you still need these capabilities and you might look toward what the gate or what a gateway might be able to do is things like authenticating unknown requests and unknown users and throttling them or applying web application firewalling, detecting SQL injection, whitelisting, blacklisting of different, uh, different users, things like request and response transformation, caching, custom security protocols and so forth. Now these are all things that you need to solve for and solve for at the edge. Another thing listed, not listed here is the ability to do API gateways and developer portals, um, self-service capabilities. So these, these are areas that the service mesh doesn't really fit in that and you know, trying to try to solve those types of problems. Service mesh is east, west traffic, and you know the, the gateway is how do we get traffic into that estate, which is a little bit different. So at the end of the day, what people want though is you know because of the, the confusion in the market and the, some of these overlapping tools, they obviously they want clarity, but they want to build applications that they can deploy potentially across multiple regions maybe multiple clouds on-premises in, in their own cloud. 
And they want to build it so that those applications are highly available, that there is a consistent notion of policy and policy enforcement, that when things go wrong, you can debug and troubleshoot and uh, reduce your mean time to recovery and, and so forth. And doing that, actually, and implementing that, and that, that's, that's what I specialize in, it's what my company, Solo.io, specializes in, building this global application networking uh, layer, that, that's going to be a combination of components like gateways and service mesh. So there isn't going to be this, I'm going to, I'm going to go away from API management and go straight to service mesh. That's going to solve all the problems, right? Um, there's still architecture. There's still uh, roles and responsibilities of the technology. And knowing when and where to use them is incredibly important. Otherwise, you end up risking going down the path of building a, a, a mess. Now, the things that we, we work on at Solo align with uh, with this. And this is, this is something that I think about constantly. And I'll, I'll hope, do I get time? I might have time here to show a quick demo. Um, but we look at it from the standpoint of, it doesn't matter where you deploy. On Kubernetes, awesome. Kubernetes is a great place. Not everybody deploys on that. And you might deploy on your uh, existing v v VMware or VM-based infrastructure or public cloud type services. But no matter where you deploy them, you need traffic to come in. You need to secure that traffic. You need to uh, implement routing and telemetry collection and so forth. And starting with something like Envoy, it can be, can be made possible by using a gateway. People understand gateways. It's a, it's a familiar part of an architecture. You can start to get operational experience with Envoy through, uh, through something like a gateway. And at Solo, we built a product called Glue that, as the name suggests, helps kind of bridge the gap and, and glue these, these different environments together by solving the, the edge gateway problem first. And then once you get traffic into these systems, you may adopt a service mesh, maybe something like Istio for your self-managed on-premises deployments, but maybe something like AWS App Mesh if you're running in uh, the AWS cloud. And when you deploy across different clusters, different um, deployment targets, maybe different clouds, you need some unifying concept, some way to federate these, these deployments so that you're not treating them as individual silos, individual pockets, but you're treating them as a single unified uh, networking fabric, networking mesh across any of these, any of these estates. And so we've, we've built tools and, uh, and, and stuff around, around solving that problem. Now, the, you know, an interesting part of this problem is that you can't just take some of these technologies and deploy them into a brownfield architecture and expect it to just work exactly the way the designers of, of these frameworks thought out, right? So you need some way to extend it and fit it into your assumptions, into, you know, these organizations that we work with have compliance and regulatory concerns. And so there's a lot of um, customization and backward compatibility -ness that they need to build into these frameworks. And so that's where WebAssembly comes into the picture. WebAssembly is a binary format for securely injecting code into these network endpoints, into things like Envoy Proxy, so you can customize the behavior of those, those different control points. And lastly, once you've built this, this global fabric of, uh, you know, of, of networking capability, you still, at the end of the day, need to expose these APIs. You still need to manage these APIs. And so building a developer portal on top of an estate like this uh, becomes hugely, hugely valuable. And so at Solo, we, do, we, we, we focus on this exact problem on uh, on building this multi-site, multi-cluster uh, networking technology using gateways, service mesh, and um, the, the management planes to run all this and, and federate all this. Uh, so the, 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 the demo I'm gonna give for you today is 
a, a developer portal experience that we've built on top of something like Istio. And Istio's gateway is sort of a lightweight ingress built on Envoy. If you need a more powerful API gateway built on Envoy, then so that, that's where we build Glue. And Glue is, is an open source project. And um, so if you go to docs.solo.io slash glue, then you'll, you'll, you know, we'll walk you through setting it up and, and doing all that. Extending something like Glue, extending something like Istio can be done with, uh, with WebAssembly. And I highly encourage you to check out uh, the web, WebAssembly Hub.io, which is sort of a uh, developer experience for getting started with uh, WebAssembly and extending Envoy. Um, so let's take a look here at the, at the developer portal. I think we have, actually we're running very low on time. I might stop here for a second uh, and see whether there are questions that popped up and I can leave links at the end for, uh, for some of the demos that I've, that I've done. But um, should we go to the questions? Is Ashley on? Hey, yeah, thanks for that. That was uh, really insightful. Thanks for that, Christian. Uh, we do have a question to kick us off. Uh, we have, what is the main trade-off when moving to decentralized API management? The main trade-off? Is that, that was the question? Yeah, exactly. Um, so what we've seen is that uh, the organizations that we work with, they're not, they need some coaching to go down this path because they're typically not ready to, because uh, like, like I said, their, their processes are fairly entrenched in this centralized way of, of thinking. Um, and, and so getting, getting the rest of their organization to think that way is, uh, is not all that easy. And there's, there's, there's struggle and, and challenge doing that. So for example, we've worked with, uh, with organization, financial organizations that wanted to go to a self-service model and they wanted to give developers more control over the configurations of their APIs, for example. They wanted to go to the whole GitOps model and, and so forth, but their operations teams were not ready for that. The developer teams were not ready for that, but the architects were saying, this is, this is, this is the way to go. Uh, so you do end up, you know, you, you get into a situation where um, you, you know the direction you want to go, but there's a lot of struggle to, to getting that down that path. And uh, some, some organizations have made that leap um, and they're successful. Some have made that leap and then they end up reverting and going back to the other, uh, you know, where, where they were. So I guess it's going to be an organizational question. Great. Thanks. Hope that answers your question, Henrik. Um, Christian, would you mind stop screen sharing so we can get a better view? Of there we go. Great. Thanks. So the next question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, when is the right moment to move to a service mesh model? How many services should you have to justify the investment? That's a great question. So my suggestion is always if you, it's, it's not always about the number of services, although that, that will eventually come into the picture, but it's about the type of services. So if your services are all written in, let's say Java, and they're all written in Spring Boot, and they're all written on the same version of Spring Boot, same version of you know some of the libraries that you end up using. Um, that's less of a there's less of a drive there to go to because uh, you you can build some of that stuff. Spring Boot has a lot of those facilities in the language and the framework itself. Um, if you have some Spring applications, some you know re reactive based applications, some Python or GoLang or you know, various different languages. Now you start to get into the, the, the path of, well, how am I going to solve these application networking problems in a consistent way and be able to maintain that? Um, so once you, once you start to feel that operational overhead or, or you foresee that operational overhead, then that's, that's, the, that's the time to look at a, a service mesh because otherwise, Operating ser services like that, those those polyglot written services, um, 
that becomes very operationally intensive, uh, which is what the mesh was was built to solve. Great, thank you. We probably have time for one more really quick one. Uh, is it anti-pattern if all APIs are deployed on a gateway, leading to traffic being almost all north-south and very little east-west? Uh, is it an anti-pattern? I would say that what you would want to watch out for, not, uh, not necessarily, but what I would watch out for there is the APIs that you do expose, um, especially if they're high rates of change, that um, maybe those APIs are more implementation detail APIs, and maybe they shouldn't be exposed. Um, now, the services that talk to each other, you know, if you're going to have to pop out to a gateway every single time a service needs to talk to a peer service or a different tier service, and you and you're going to have to go through a gateway for that uh, for every every hop, that may make not not as much sense, right? You might that that might be more of a class for for ser service mesh to solve that. Um, so by by itself, the question I wouldn't say is an anti pattern per se, but um, it is it is something to at least consider. Well, what should we expose, and when should we not? Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christian, for your time, and it was really informative session. Not now. My pleasure. Thank you. We're in Phoenix. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the conference.